you, Caroline. And you're all set. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so um, I thought we could do just a quick presentation of each of us, um, as we're not too, too many. Um, so I just want to start uh, with myself. So I'm uh, Caroline. I work at a support company in Montreal, Canada. And um, the idea of this meeting came about uh, during COACON, the last COACON in May. And uh, I think it was during Donna's presentation um, and she was presenting all these cool things that she was doing for training. And I thought, well, we're all doing cool things each in our corner. So I thought we could maybe share them uh, if they're shareable, of course. And um, so that, that was the point of this meeting, kind of. So if anyone wants to go ahead and um, introduce themselves. Okay, somebody has to. Uh, someone has to go first. Uh, I'm Fred King, uh, Washington, D.C. It's uh, 10 o'clock here, a.m. Uh, see, the office lighting makes me look like a troll, so that's why I'm wearing a hat, so I look like a troll in a hat. Um, and uh, I'm part of COA US, as is George. And... I guess that's enough of an introduction for now. Okay. <coughs> Anyone else wants to uh, introduce themselves? No, I was I'll trying to when I started coughing there. Uh, there we go. Um, <coughs> maybe somebody else. <laughs> well, George gathers himself. I'll go ahead and go. So I'm Donna Vachowski, and I'm one of the educators with Biowater. Um, uh, just um, I, I just there's so much about Koha and what it does it is amazing and we recognize that um, the the training parts of it and the documentation parts are areas that we're working on and David is leading the charge on the documentation um, so let's go ahead you know this is really just kind of a way to start you know working together and making sure we get all of those resources out there and are truly sharing um, the way that we want to so I'm really excited about all of this um, and Carolyn I would actually suggest um, everyone appears in a different order on your screen. So if you want, just call people out <laughs> so that we don't have everyone talking at the same time. <laughs> I'll go. I'm with Donna, Bywater Solutions, one of the educators. I've been with Bywater for about two and a half years and would love to see this move forward as documenting and helping each other teach COA is, is great news. All right, so I know um, Fauzi's microphone doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> maybe he Heather, do you want to go ahead and say a few words? Sure, I'm Heather. I'm the technical services librarian at San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. And I would love to learn how I could participate more in uh, in. I think she froze. She froze. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, there she goes. Okay. I thought yeah. you were gathering your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, cataloging is my specialty, uh, but we also work with SCLC. So um, I think there are a lot of ways that people could do more within the MARC format, that it doesn't have to be. Uh, so rigid and so standardized that there are ways to be really creative and make it work for different settings, but that knowledge is pretty arcane and I think it would be great to get more of that out there for people. Okay, well, I think so I the can next talk one. Now. Oh, yeah, go ahead, George. Uh, I'm George Williams, I'm the uh, uh, Next Search Catalog Coordinator for Northeast Kansas Library System. Uh, and I do training for people at 51 different locations in Northeast Kansas. And some of the training, I, most of the training I do, I actually go places and talk to people 
Um, I try to do some of it uh, online. I try to make videos while we're doing upgrades and things like that. But um, training is an issue here for us, so I thought I would participate and see if there's anything anybody else is doing that would help us and vice versa. Maybe there are things that I'm doing that I haven't even realized what other people aren't. So. Um, maybe Andrew, did you want to say something? Sure. Hello. I'm Andrew. Um, I'm the third educator at Bywater. I don't think I have a lot to say that Kelly and Donna didn't already say, except hi. <laughs> I'm also excited to be here. Yay. Um, Fiona, do you have a microphone? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you hear me, cool. I have kept my video off because it's three just after three o'clock in the afternoon here. My children will be coming home from school soon. <laughs> so I've kept the video off, but yeah, on my, on my mic. So yeah, I'm Fiona from PTFS Europe and I'm one of the trainers in, in that company. So, and I obviously participated in COACON discussion. So it's good to, good to get a wider audience now, I think. Okay. All right, Holly, do you have a microphone? Um, can you hear me? No, sorry, it's not working. Yeah, speak louder, we can hear Very something. quiet, Holly. Um, let's see if I can raise the volume a little bit without killing my coworkers. Um, can people hear me now? Is it a bit better? Um, yep, so my name's Holly, I'm from Interleaf Technology in Ireland. We hosted CohaCon uh, this year. Um, my role is generally support and training. I did a small talk on training at COACON, people might remember it. Um, and I'm really here to see how I can get more involved in the different areas of the community and see um, what input other people have that can help me do my job better and more efficiently. That's uh, really it. All right, thank you, Holly. Uh, David? Yeah, hi. Um David and from New Zealand and yeah I think that is quite a, a nice tie up between training and documentation and and some of those things um I obviously don't do Koha training at all so but yeah so I'm quite interested to see what people are doing and it'd be great it'd be good to see what happens and learn from what everyone else is doing yes I think that's um what everyone is looking for here <laughs> Um, Jason, do you have a microphone? Uh, he said in chat that he does not. Uh, whoops, sorry, I didn't see that. Sorry, I forgot to unmute my thing. <laughs> and uh, Daphne, do you have a microphone? I do. I'm not sure it's working. Can you hear me? Okay, so I work with Holly in Interleaf, so echo everything that she said. All right, cool. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I proposed an agenda, but if anyone wants to um, add anything, feel free. Um, so the first uh, thing on the agenda was um, ideas for collaboration for training. So um, I put a couple of ideas there, um, but if anybody else has something. So my first idea was maybe just get on the wiki and put all our stuff on there. The stuff that is shareable, of course. Um, so, um, but I was wondering like how to structure that wiki page if we create one. Um, so yeah, that was the first one. Um, I had yeah the mailing list, which is another one, and um, any other means of collaboration. And also, um, if there are things that we can share or develop as a community. So I know we already work on the manual um, as a community. <clears throat> um, and during this, uh, his talk at the COACON, the last COACON, David talked about all the forms of documentation um, that there was. And I remember one of his slides was divided in four. And there was um, tutorials, how-to guides, explanation, and uh, reference, which is the manual. So I was wondering if one of those things could be done as a communi community. Um, 
for us, I think um, all of you are from English speaking um, countries, um, but I'm from a French uh, speaking place. So um, I know translatability is an issue for me. Um, so I know like tutorials, like video tutorials and things like that, I would have to do on my own on, on you know, on my side, but um, I'm guessing like how to guides or uh, things like that could be done or maybe just written tutorials could be done um, by all of us. So does anybody have <laughs> something to say about this? I don't want to take all the place and talk all the time, so. How feasible would it be to take an English uh, video tutorial um, and dub it in, say, French? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if we could do, like, subtitles or something like that, maybe. Um, otherwise, I think we'd have to, like do some mixing or whatever to uh to put the the audio on top of the video i'm not sure how that will work but then again of course koa will look english with english words even if it's subtitled in french it's still it would be difficult for a user to follow along <laughs> I, I would think i mean i agree yeah i didn't think of that yeah, neither did I. I was thinking with subtitles, you'd have to be paying attention to the subtitles and what's going on on the screen. So. I think a wiki page is, is probably a good idea broken out by module. Um, and then as um, things are created or um, decide, like how one works with system preferences, like Donna's presentation, who was masterminded by Andrew, um, could be something that was on there for your system preference training. Um, OPAC searching could be another kind of just breaking them out where people could kind of plop things to say this works um, to teach this. I, I kind of like for the community is the idea of a wiki um, appeals to me because it's something that um, is easy for different people to uh, contribute to without having to go through a lot of, of uh, special training or, or uh, you know, it, it's an easy to understand way of contributing. Right, I agree with that. And you can link out and you can, you know, attach PDFs and link to URLs. So there is that functionality there. Yeah, so we don't need anything more uh, complicated than that. So, so it's just basic and it meets our needs. So that would be good. Of course, one of the problems, the side effect of a, of a wiki is, um, uh, I know if you look at the community wiki, a lot of times it's really easy to find things that are completely out of date um, and, uh, and that don't apply anymore that are, you know, for the people use, still using version two, um, you, you sometimes come across things like that, but this works in version 2.4 or whatever, you know, um, that can be an issue as well. So it, on the one hand, a wiki is really easy to contribute to, but it's also really easy to, to get uh, bad information. If it wants to now that we've talked about how great wikis are, you know, there's the bad thing. <laughs> But actually, you know, George has a really valid point. I mean, we're even finding within Bywater that we're having to constantly go back and redo our videos because there are videos out there that are three point something versions. Um, and it is hard to keep that ongoing, you know, update happening. Um, and so that is a challenge that we do need to kind of watch for is how do we make sure that we keep that going. But we can do this. We'll be the first group ever to make sure our wiki is constantly up to date, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's wishful a thinking, challenge, right? though, isn't it? I mean, we, we at PTFS, we used to maintain our own um, training guides that we would present at training, but they would just became out of date so quickly that we didn't have the manpower to keep them up to date. So we just then decided to just point everybody to the manual, which is up as up to date as it can be at all times. So I think that's just a challenge that we, we face with anything. But but you're right, we can between us all, we can keep can do it. <laughs>
speaking of outdated documentation, when I do a Google search, uh, for some reason it takes me to documentation from 3.2. I'm not sure there's a way to eradicate the really outdated, dangerous stuff. Yeah, well, I'm. It's just because we're not sure if I'm. I'm guessing this is my hypothesis. Um, is because some people are still using Koha three point something or two point something. So we don't. I guess we don't want to erase any uh, historical manual. Good point. Yeah, we found things in one manual that haven't been transferred to the next manual. So it's helpful to say, hey, this was here. This is still valid. Move it over to the the newer manual, too. So I know that a Google search, although brings up older results, sometimes we'll find something that you actually want. <laughs> I, somebody else was about to speak. I was going to hold off. So. Oh, I was just going to say I hadn't seen the Koha US um, learn part of the website. It looks great. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, saw I threw it. that up there because um, it's it's one of the ways. It's um, I think Jason is responsible for the for the uh, icons, um, but that was uh, something that the Koha US Education Committee has been started to work on. And it started out just kind of as a way to organize um, things on our website. But uh, it would be nice if this was like a front end to something that had more, that was more customizable. That it'd be nice if this is the front end to like wiki pages or something that, that uh, uh, other people outside of the Koha US Education Committee had control over, so. Yeah, I saw that. I was um, lurking at the uh, education committee meeting last week, um, and uh, I saw that page, and I thought, "Wow, it's just it's so well organized." And um, I think we should get you know get inspired by this page because it's it's just so easy to navigate. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen it before, but it looks good. Definitely. Good job, Koha US. Like I said, I think Jason is in the chat. He's the one that I think did the, uh, did make sure the icons looked Koha-ish. <laughs> Jason, responding to your chat, isn't Koha itself pretty much a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> always, always room for improvement. Um, okay, so the next point on my agenda, so we agree that we're gonna make a wiki page by module and try to put all our stuff there. Maybe just um, write the version next to your thing so that we know what version it's for. Um, so if we're training for, I know I still have people on 18, so um, uh, 18.5, so um, I'm, you know, all my stuff is for 18.5, um, but I'm going to update them when we upgrade everybody. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, things that we should develop as a community, I think that was, um, maybe a touch and go kind of thing that we weren't sure because of the translation issue. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, but um, I think we, because we here at Libro, we started working on a knowledge base. So just like, like the one I'm working on right now is how to use mark modification modules, um, models for um, importing. So it's just like how to do X, you know, you don't, you don't want to go in the manual and search for whatever. Um, and if you don't know the terms or things like that, you know, you just want to remove this thing that I always get from my uh, imported uh, records. 
So um, I'm, I'm wondering if that is something that we could work on. Um, like the manual and this on the side too. Anybody has a... Uh... Yeah, that's, that's kind of the direction that we're moving a little bit more to is it's not just, you know, here's your preferences, but more telling stories. Um, and I'm gonna put Andrew on the spot here because he did amazing work with this. Um, as far as trying to explain to new libraries the statuses and lost and all of that sort of stuff. And so Andrew put together a really great document to kind of guide through. So I'm going to let Andrew talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, and this came up because we had a, a specific library that <laughs> the, the, their lead person and I had a real clash of like learning styles, basically. She really wanted everything written down and I'm not a writey downy person. And our whole process is, is much more verbal. So after the training, she came back to me and, and threw a whole bunch of, okay, how do I make lost statuses work? What does missing mean? Like all, all those questions that we had talked about, but we really needed that all stuck together one place. Um, so yeah, I wrote up a, a document that walked through all those different item statuses. Of, you know, this is where lost lives. And these are the five different places that you can modify what lost does because that really is just scattered all over the place and we don't have the the manual doesn't it's not topic based in that way i'm, I'm struggling for the word like it, it'll point you like you can find all the five different places where you modify what how lost behaves but there's not a place that says here's everything about lost um yes and uh Somebody, George, I think, put just put the blog post in chat. It's a very like dense, boring blog post, but it's but it's good information. Yeah, workflow based. That that's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, so I, we're trying to find places that it makes sense to sort of pull things together into a document. Ho hopefully, something we can give to people at training. Although we get back again to that perpetual issue of training handouts of this is good for how long and how am I going to find time and remember to update it when stuff changes. And then, and then Andrew, you took that and then you created a survey for new libraries. And the survey needs work because the survey, this is another perpetual training problem. Like how do I ask you upfront about how your Koha should be set up when you don't yet have any idea what mark lost item is returned means in any sense. So you need to go back to that survey and fight with that survey some more and figure out how to make that survey make sense to someone who has not yet been through three days of training. But I think it's a good start to tie in all this information. You do the survey, even if you do it after training, and then it submit, you know, it spits out the system preferences, what you need to set. Like it is asking you questions to lead you to those system preferences. So mm -hmm. It is, it is great, Andrew. Will you be able to share that uh, survey? <laughs> yeah, um, let me it, find it. Is yeah, it's in the, oh yeah, so maybe the raw one, not the actual survey. Is that what you mean? Because it's on that yeah. five cents. Oh, I have to remember what I called it. Koha item status setup. Oh, that was pretty straightforward. <laughs> um. So I'm going to put George on the spot because he's, you know, coughing up lungs. So that's a great time to ask him questions. Um, what, what's like one of the more popular requests that you get from your libraries, what they want when they finish training? Do they want like pieces of paper to hold on to? I, I mean, what are they looking for? Um, since there are so many of them, it's like um, about a third of them want documents about a third of them want uh an in-person here i am ask me questions training and the other third um, just want someplace where they can go uh, on the internet and watch a video and not have to talk to me i guess uh or um or some kind of a document you know they, they want something that they can look at online so it's really split um, pretty evenly, and that's why we try to do, um, you know, for the for the last upgrade, you know, I did 
um, trainings, uh, two of them outside of our main office. And um, then I recorded videos that went along with the things that we were adopting in the upgrade. And then I put those all into a website that I uh, made with uh, Sphinx that could also be printed out as a PDF so that I kind of covered all of the bases. Um, and, you know, this all stems from the fact that, you know, when I got here three years ago, the one thing everybody said they wanted was more training. And so we had actually adopted policies that before any upgrade, we will do at least three trainings and only one of them will be at, at least two of them will not be at our main office. We will go out in other places because the people that used to do this job would only do them here. They would expect everybody to come to the hub for the training. And um, so we tried to make sure that, you know, the one thing everybody wanted, they said more training, more training, more training. And that was, and that was their excuse. That was why they said they never came to training is because it was inconvenient. It was too far. And so now uh, they don't come to the trainings that I do in other places. <laughs> Instead of not coming to the training here, they just don't come to the training that's like five miles from them. So. Five whole miles? You're crazy. <laughs> no, actually, they're better about it. You know, there are some libraries that w would never come to trainings, but when we go and we're like, you know, in their building, they have a lot harder, of, it's a lot harder for them to justify not coming. Um, but still, they, you know, we can be like three or four miles from a library and then they still don't send anybody. So, <clears throat> and, you know, part of it is we have a, a wide range of libraries. Our smallest library isn't much bigger than my office. It's only got like about 4,000 items in it. And they are only open like 14 hours a week. And then our biggest library has like 60 employees and, and you know, 100,000 items. So it's, we have a really wide range, uh, which is why we try to make sure there's a wide range of ways for them to interact with training. Now, Heather, I'm curious, you know everything. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, from your perspective, and you've been around for a while too with, you know, using the resource and you're such a great resource for us. Um, we ask you stuff, quite frankly. Um, so <laughs> what, how could we be, a, a, you know, as the community as a whole, how can we be of better assistance? What, what should we be focusing on? Well, the, the things that I'm thinking of are that, um, our staff is really, really small, but very nimble. And I'm the only one in my institution that speaks Mark at all. And what my coworkers have trouble even doing is articulating what they want because it's also very vague. And they oftentimes, it, it works best to do something like you do at the optometrist. I'll just create a little record that looks like A or, and then something that looks like B and just show them and say, what do you want? Do you want A or B? And so something that I've been thinking of is if we could, I mean, perhaps be useful to set up little things that just look like this and do those screenshots and host them somewhere and then have then the power of a wiki is it could link out to those examples and perhaps this might be useful for new users who have never implemented koha or seen koha or haven't seen what the new version is going to look like is we could show them these test examples and have them be uh you know quite fun records with the history of chocolate or, uh, you know, I want a coffee now. And, and those are the sorts of things that oftentimes stick in people's minds and make, make the learning fun. And so uh, that's what, that, those are sort of along the lines of something that I was thinking of that could be resources that, I could be helpful in creating that way because I've managed to convince you that I know a lot. <laughs> Whereas I know a great deal about a really tiny part of things. <laughs> um, 
I, I agree that um, example records would be a great way to uh, show what what Koha can do. And also, I know in our clients, we have a lot of non-library libraries. <laughs> so we have like genealogy societies and, uh, and uh, little documentation centers that are really specific to one subject. And they are not librarians. They have never seen Mark. And uh, so most of the time what I do is I, when I do the configuration, I, I make them like a really simple um, mark framework um, mm -hmm. but if they could you know see what what it can be other than that that would be great too exactly and perhaps we could come up with I mean I can certainly create those sorts of records and create a sample that would look just about any way and then that could that could live someplace or I could create that data set as a suppressed set in our catalog and then be able to make those records available on demand or if there were uh, you know a, just a test Koha anywhere or it were uh, you know a particular branch perhaps on the bywater test you know, we could we could then have any kind of record that could show the genealogy center or the uh, the research lab that does specific genetic biochemical research what their article database could look like or even the uh, you know the primary school young kids library that sort of thing and we could serve up those types of records to show them some possibilities. I'd also like to put in a plug for my uh, MedStar Authors catalog, MedStarAuthors.org. <clears throat> I think some of you have seen it, not everyone. I took uh, Medline records, uh, which is medical citations, and turned them into Mark and created a few Mark fields. And Henrietta Avram is probably turning over in her grave. Um, or cheering me on, I'm not sure which. Uh, but, um, and I keep, me, I keep intending to write this up, but uh, I've been intending to do it for a while. <laughs> but also, I was thinking of trying Omeka, but maybe Koa, since I know it really well, turning into a uh, catalog of photographs. It's really easy to use Koha for photographs. <laughs> Uh, Heather, I think we need to chat it sometime. Yes. <laughs> and document it. <laughs> I told you document, she was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and just a, another aside, it is possible to add Mark Fields to the uh, uh, index. So you can search on, let's say, the 651. Yeah, Jason just oh. put a really good handout in the chat box there. Fred, I don't think I've seen your MedStar. What did you say? MedStar.org? M-E-D-S-T-A-R authors, oh, one word, dot org. It was running kind of slowly yesterday. I don't know if it was our firewall. Let me take a look. Yeah. Okay, and yesterday I uh, updated the RSS feed for the new items, and I found a much faster way to do the RSS feed. Um, I wanted to say about the test Koha, um, I know we're supposed to uh, make one for um, cataloging plugins. So um, maybe we'll just use that one. You know, we could use it for whatever. So um, I'll let you know as soon as it's set up. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of migrations going on right now, so um, it's not in our priorities, unfortunately, <coughs> but um, uh, yeah, so I'll let you know and then we can uh, I can give you access and you can create 
records, you know, sample records for whatever you need. This is a slight tangent uh, about Zoom. Uh, is the chat automatically saved or do I have to save it myself? Yes, it is automatically saved. I don't know oh, if good. when you watch it though, you see the chat. No. So, no, the chat is in a separate document. Yeah, so we'll have to share that separately because it doesn't come over, I don't believe. Yeah, no, it saves it as a what, .txt file or something. And what we'll do is we'll post the .txt file along with the Zoom link. So is there a place on the Koha Wiki currently for training, education, or anything? Well, I admit that I didn't look. Uh, <laughs> but I don't. I think I'm trying to reinvent the wheel here, maybe. If there is, I have never seen it. <laughs> Okay, so I search for training and the first page is Tamil. So I don't think there's anything. Maybe just education. No, nope. here, right? This is where we're looking, wiki.coha hyphen community. There's a shared resource page. Yeah, that might be a good. Okay, so maybe we could link off that page um, for our training stuff. Because mm -hmm. this seems um, just like a, a list of the wiki pages that have information, like the, the SQL reports library and things like that. Yeah, I don't, I can't see anything that looks, um, what we're talking about. So yeah, if we just create something and start, and if we find other stuff as you do. So I'm just coming back to the um, how-to guides and things like that. Is that something that we would want um, to uh, develop a, like on the side of the manual maybe? Or because um, I know the manual is, is a bit um, scary for some people because it uses Git and everything. And um, uh, <clears throat> so I'm wondering, <laughs> Fred is like, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm wondering, should those how-tos be hosted like in a different way or I'm just wondering because of translatability issues again, but um, yeah, should we just start them on the wiki and then you know, try to evolve from there, maybe get in some de development people to help us or? Yeah. Can we start with the wiki and then at some point maybe link the manual to the wiki? Like we had the, you know, there are some system preferences that link to a wiki page. Mm -hmm. 
include, you know, there, I can see the manual saying, you know, something click here. I don't know. There may be yeah. some you don't want to link, but then there's some that are really like, like Andrew's lost thing. Do you want to tie all these things together with a bow? This is where you go. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how hard that is, but yeah, I don't really like the GitHub either. <laughs> so Caroline has worked with me. <laughs> to do yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I, wherever it is, it's uh, useful and then incorporate it into the manual um, or if appropriate. Um, uh, yeah, as long as it's somewhere and, uh, you know, happy to do the work to get it into the manual. If, yeah. And it, it uh, as long as it's somewhere and that somewhere doesn't change because otherwise yeah. we'll get dead links. So. I like the idea of contributing to a wiki because my area of knowledge is so tiny in particular that I lack that global Koha knowledge to really know if it would be appropriate for the manual. So I like the idea that I can contribute it to a wiki and that someone with more overarching knowledge and uh, experience could, could vet it and decide and then incorporate as appropriate into the manual and that that link would, could always go to the wiki. All right, cool. So I'll I'll create a wiki page that li that links off that shared resource uh, page that um, I think it was Kelly f who found it, and um, <clears throat> I'll also create um, a how like a general just how to page, and we can link from there um, just like the different how tos, and um, and then that way we can. Uh, add them uh, to the manual afterwards. Sounds good for everyone? Yep. A question, we talk, uh, in part of the agenda talks about a listserv. Do we think there needs to be a separate sort of way to communicate within like a documentation or education or the Koha listserv is the best way? Just a, just a question. I would say that the COA listserv is the best way because uh, everybody looks at it. And uh, if you have a separate yeah, education one, it might not reach everyone. Uh, the uh, medical librarians listserv keeps debating whether interlibrary loan requests should go out on a separate ILL. And people keep saying no, because no one will read it. So. And as long as I've got the floor, apparently, or at least a little orange, uh, yellow, yellow box, I'd like to encourage uh, my, you, my distinguished colleagues, to consider uh, documentation for someone who, like me, is going it alone, uh, who's a little confused about this and that, and uh, had to pick all knowledge up in the gutter. Uh, because one of the great benefits of COA is that anybody can use it, anyone can set it up. Um, I'm working very slowly, and I have to have it ready for this year's COA US conference. Uh, I talk about uh, got a hundred dollars, get an ILS. I'm trying to put a semi-working system onto a Raspberry Pi, and then use Z3950. Uh, so consider the. Um, complete utter newbie who would like to have an ILS. I think I'll be quiet now. Yeah. Um, on that, I did manage to get it working on a um, Raspberry Pi. And there's a new gruntier one who's just come out. So um, that sounds good. Um, yeah. Um, the thing I, yeah, when I get my, get some work done is, you know, trying to do that getting started guide ideas and shorter tutorials and rather than this really massive manual that you're not quite sure where to start so yeah I, certainly something i'd like to see and i guess i i should be doing that really 
No, you're the manager. You get to uh, to have uh, <laughs> minions to do the work for you. <laughs> the power, the power. <laughs> Going back to what we were saying about um, potentially setting up a new list serve, though, I know it's a bit, you know the Koha chat is is general and everybody does get it, but I do find myself deleting a lot of messages at times when you're totally like inundated with emails and you're just having a clear out of your inbox. So for me personally, if we had a separate one, I'd pick them up more because I would see that they were outside the general chat. But that's just a personal opinion of mine. Uh, how about this? Um, and this is from Medalib L. <coughs> uh, the general uh, sort of rules and customs. Uh, if you're uh, requesting for an ILL, you put in the subject on ILL colon or uh, tomorrow when I send out the new um, Avenging Chicken link, it's going to be chat colon. At least I hope it's ready for tomorrow. Um, <laughs> uh, try to get people to do a little sorting and then you can just go down um, row by row, delete, 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 delete. Mm. So like education colon your subject. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So that way we, we reach yeah. a lot of people, but we still get it like organized. Yeah, because also there'd be an awful lot of people in the general community that wouldn't be interested in the education chat. So if there was any way to keep that separate, then we save spamming everybody else as well. So yeah, that would be an option. From my perspective, I just don't want to have another list that I don't have time to read because I'm on like 20 lists. So so having just education colon, that would be, um, that would be my favorite uh, option. And you could also set it up to filter something into a folder. And then in 10 years, when you uh, have 10 minutes, uh, go back. Yeah, they filter the, all these ones just right into the trash bin, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. At least that's the way I have my Fred King email set up, so. Yeah, I, fig I was starting to figure that out. Um. All right, so are we moving on to the next um, point? Because it's, it's 10 to 11, so I don't want to go over too, too much. But is there someone who wants to share something that they do that works super great? Um, I like the idea of the survey. So that one is one that I'm going to copy and uh, <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> Um, but if someone else has uh, something, I'm trying to think of something that we do, but other than the knowledge base, I don't think we do anything that's like out of the ordinary. Colleagues and Interly Fair, just on the survey point, we do something similar and we've been trying to develop um, similar practices where we try to get in contact with the libraries, similar to what's been brought up before. Sometimes we're dealing with non-library libraries and non-librarian library staff um, and the one of the things we found to be useful in our surveys say just a contrast to the bywasher one is we often don't specifically mention system preferences or use specific koha language right off the bat um, we prefer to start using it when we actually start training in person and the reason just what well, this is and as i say it's just experience that we found this um, uh, using uh, Koha language is really important but if we wait until someone actually gets there in person and can sort of be there to assure them that there's nothing to worry about it's just common uh, phrases that they need to learn um, what they mean in particular contexts. if they're introduced to Koha language before someone is present often it can be a bit intimidating and it can kind of put them off and it can maybe bring people to the training in a less than receptive mood. Um, that's the only thing I have to add just off the top of my head, but um, yeah.
I just, you know, the idea of doing a survey before the training, I think is an excellent idea all by itself, you know, as far as anything anybody shared here today. I'm doing a training just for some new staff at one of our libraries on uh, Tuesday, I guess. And so it's a little um, late to send them a survey now because I don't know if any of them are going to be working between now and then. But, you know, knowing what those five people are, where they're at now, before I get there, you know, I, I don't know why I've never thought of it before. It's a good idea, so. Well, and the survey is, is also kind of an, an outgrowth of the policy call that we do for before all our trainings, where we try to take like an hour and a half and just talk about how does your library work, and that we do try really hard to not dive into COHA terminology, but instead just talk about, okay, well, what are your overdues like? What are your fines like? How do you catalog, get a real broad outline to help us know what we need to do in Koha, what we need to talk about, what we don't need to talk about, what we can set ahead of time. Um, and another thing that we've, we do a lot of tutorial videos. Um, we have found that users watch about three minutes of a tutorial video, um, which makes it very hard to um, communicate much in three minutes. Um, but knowing that, we definitely have tried to like snapshot specific things versus going into longer time periods of trying to explain everything there is to know about Lost. Um, and then we've also because there are a variety of different learning styles, with a video, we try to also do step-by-steps. So they may feel that they can't do, you know, focus on the tutorial if they're writing, but if they have the steps and can watch the video, then they have that feeling of being able to walk away or be able to refer back to then watch the video again or anything like that. Um, I have a question that's maybe a, it's not totally off topic. It's just about um, as people when people are actually training um, in Interleaf, we generally set up uh, like a staging server. So it's kind of just like a, a practice area and we give everyone a login and that way people can practice with stuff as we go along. Or if someone, you know, wants to test something else, they can do that and they don't have to worry about deleting information or, or things getting um uh, messed up or, or missed. I was just wondering, is that how people generally approach training or is it more show and tell or, or how do people f help? Yeah. I can see one people's person shaking their heads. So that's good. I'm just yeah. looking. For we, do, yeah. we have a first load of their data. So that helps us not only with the migration process to make sure their data is loading correctly, but also it gives us the training site. And so they have access to that training site and it actually works really well, which, which I'm sure you've discovered too. Um, that the staff don't have to worry about messing anything up. Yeah. They can play with patron records. They can charge fines. They can do whatever they need to um, and, and be able to do that. So yeah, we do the same thing. It's, it makes it so much easier for training to have that hands on. And then when you leave training, they've got that still to work with up until go live. Great. Well, and we with Bywater, we have a test server that, uh, you know, like this last upgrade that we did, they upgraded our test server months before we did our um, upgrade on our production server. And so I was able to do training with staff on the test server for, you know, a month, a month and a half before we actually did our actual upgrade. The only problem I've ever had with the test server is, you know, I've got a blue background on it and little words that say test server, test server, test server, test server, test server, everywhere on the page. And somebody will still log into the test server and spend a whole day doing their circulation on the test server yeah. um, and, and then lose, essentially lose a whole day's data. And all these patrons, you know, our last test server sync was in February. And so all these people come in and, you know, how, I, I'm sure I turned that book back in March, you know, and it's because people, you know, accidentally stay on the test server with the blue background and big letters that say test server. And, uh, Have you ever had the opposite happen where someone thinks they're on the test server and they're actually on the live? and then they delete something probably <laughs> and they haven't confessed to you yet probably <laughs> i've also found that uh, test server uh, it's great for teaching myself how to do stuff because um, i taught myself virtual box made up uh, 
half a dozen images in various stages. And if I break one, so what? Uh, especially when I'm trying to um, do the OPAC templates, which one little wrong thing can break the whole template. At PTFS, our approach is similar to what Donna described. We, did, we do the uh, test load first. So the training is done on the customer system using their data and configuration in a test environment. And then going forward, they would only have the test testing platform if they had an additional test server. Otherwise, they're onto their live server at that point. But training is always done on a test instance. Yeah, the test server is something we actually pay by water extra for in our annual contract. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, in Southeast, uh, Jason actually sets up his own test environment for, for upgrades and stuff. So that's something that I know some libraries do also. I think um, where I used to work, yeah, Jason says it's a mess, but fine. Um, where I used to work, um, I don't think they... I think they had like a combination. I think eventually after I left, I think they set up a test server, but I'm not sure about that. And, and, and I don't really care anymore, so. All right, so um, I think I'm gonna wrap this up uh, right now because it's uh, one minute to 11. Um, so I want to thank everybody for participating in this um, meaning and uh, I think we we got a, a lot of good ideas and I am going to follow up on those ideas and post them to the mailing list with education Colin <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah and if um, oh no uh, should we set a meeting for um, and like uh, a date for a next one right now, or uh, yeah, I see nods. So, um, <laughs> all right. So um, let me just check my calendar. For the uh, sake of New Zealand, we should probably do it later. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. 2 a.m. Is, is a wee bit late or early, I'm not sure when. <laughs> It, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm happy, but I think Catalyst has some training staff, but as well. So, but I'm not sure what time they would prefer, but probably not midnight. No. <laughs> well, I remember one time we got uh, Chris Cormack to do the keynote at uh, Coa US. I think he had to get up at four and his cat started walking around behind him. <laughs> Well, and it's Friday there now, isn't it, David? Yes, it is. Like it is 2 a.m. Friday? It is 3 a.m. Friday. 3 a.m. Friday, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite hard finding times that suit everyone and getting a good number of people. But Yeah. Um, so I was looking at um, maybe in the fall or um, in the winter, well, for us, sorry, David, in the summer for you. Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking maybe like October or November, would that be too, too soon or too late? I think that seems good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know, I'm just gonna pick a date, like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's hard to to choose something for everybody but uh, let's see November Okay, so would um, maybe 
Um, Because I see that there's a a COA US Education Committee meeting on the 20th of November. So do we want to do it like just before so they can, um, so they can, uh, sorry, I'm missing my words. Um, So they can um, do like a summary of what we said uh, during their meeting, would that be, would that be good? And then we could uh, harvest your ideas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. So I don't see anybody saying no. So I'll go with uh, November 19th. And um, so now it's 14 UTC. So um, what's a good time, David, for you? If we want to rotate um uh, i'm i'm fine I, yeah no but for for yeah. your your um, time zone <laughs> uh yeah 20 uh, normally like 19 or 20 but that's like what's that that's normally like eight or nine but then that's quite late for everyone else so okay yeah. So, well, I think we, we do have uh, IRC meetings at 19 or 20 UTC. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so I'm guessing uh, most people um, already are used to having meetings <laughs> at that time. So, <clears throat> all right. So let me just check what 19 UTC is for me. Okay, so uh, for East Coast people, um, 19 UTC is 3 p.m. So, um, I will put that on the 19th of November at 3 p.m. or um, 19 UTC. All righty. Will it be the same Zoom URL, Donna? Okay. It'll be a new one. Um, what I'll do is I've already booked it, so I'll go ahead and send that to Carolyn um, along with the link and things like that, and we can put it all in that one message that goes out. So. Cool. Perfect. Thank you, Donna. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, so we'll chat again on the mailing list, and uh, we'll chat again in video, um, and not in person, but in video uh, in November. Hey, thank you, everyone. This was Thanks. fun. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Bye. Thanks, Karen. Bye.